factors that make this talk very, very essential for anybody interested in megaliths. The first is that Howard has done more work than anybody else in the area of Brittany. And he's done it thoroughly, and he's done it with good scientific background principles. The second thing is that he takes wonderful photographs, and he can explain what he's done. And he does that in English. So if you are inspired, as I'm sure you will be by this talk, uh, you might like to consider either this year or in future years attending the wonderful Solstice Festival that's held at, near Karnak uh, in June every year and go and see what is an absolutely amazing collection of megaliths scattered around the landscape, many of which you will never even have heard of in English or in French. So I'd like to get, uh, ask you to give a warm welcome to uh, Howard Crowhurst. Thank you, Howard. Hello. <laughs> uh, I'm very pleased to be able to talk to you about these Karnak megaliths. It's the first time I've ever done so in English. I'm very used to talking about them in French, but I hope my English is going to be up to... There's all the vocabulary. Well, anyway, if, if you don't understand anything, just butt in. So, uh, these are the Karnak uh, megaliths. We talk about Karnak, but in fact it's a whole area of France, of southern Brittany. Now, is this going to move? Yes, it is. Uh, just to situate what we're talking about on the map, which I'll be doing all the time, uh, the area we're going to be looking at is here. It's the southern... It's called Le Morbihan, which means the Little Sea. Uh, it's in southern Brittany. Here's a bigger picture of it. <coughs> and the Karnak alignments are these. But we'll be looking also at the Erdogan alignments, the St. Barb alignments in Plouanel, the St. Pierre Quibron alignments, the Gavrinis um, chambered temple instead of tomb. And the Grand Menia Brise, which maybe some of you have heard about, which is the largest standing stone ever erected, which was over 20 meters high. First of all, then, we're going to look at Karnak uh, and the different alignments. So first of all, I'll present the monuments, and then we'll try and understand, maybe, what they're about. First of all, in Karnak, there are supposedly three series of alignments. Uh, which are end-to-end -end and go over four kilometers long. The first one's called Le Menek, which you can see on an aerial view here. It starts here. There's a cromlech, or stone circle. Well, it's not a circle, it's a, a stone egg, which it goes round the village here. And then these alignments go off in a certain direction. And then they change direction about halfway up. So if you look at these stones, there are quite a lot of them. In the Karnak alignments, there are 3,000 standing stones uh, today. Another interesting feature is that this is bedrock, um, and these standing stones are uh, put up on virtually no soil. All right? So some of them, you can actually see them balanced on the bedrock. Uh, I won't be able to talk about the geological side of things in this talk, because I've had to choose what I'm going to talk about. But if you do come to Pluhanel in the month of June, I'll be explaining as well the geological uh, part of this monument, which is very interesting as well. Uh, this is the part of the Cromlech which goes around the village. It's the Cromlech, the, the Menek egg. The stones are touching each other, you know, and it goes all the way around this village. In fact, goes through a house on the, on the left here. Some of the stones are recumbent and were most probably like that from the word go. Uh, some very big stones. This stone is particularly, where is it? This stone is particularly important, these recumbent stones, because they position things. They're sort of central points. And there are the alignments. The alignments are very often on a plateau, and then they go downhill. So that's uh, another thing we find. They go through water and ice, <laughs> up and downhill. Now here's the Kermario. So these are a bit further along. 
when you get to the end of the Lumenic allowance we've just seen, you do about 460 meters, <laughs> and then you come to the beginning of these alignments. You have a dolmen here. These, this, this is the head of the alignments, and these alignments go up through this lake. There are standing stones at the bottom of the lake, and the, uh, they end around here. Well, the fencing, I mean, you may know that Karnak alignments were fenced off about 20 years ago, uh, and the fencing ends here, but the alignments, in fact, continue in the woods. <laughs> Right. So these are the Care Mario alignments, as you can see. Uh, I don't know how many of you have already visited this site, but it's really quite impressive. This is the uh, Care Mario Dolmen. I'm doing a survey. You saw the first picture at the beginning, where I was with the theodolite on the recumbent stone. Uh, I'd like to thank Robin Heath, who got me back into theodolite work two years ago when he came to Pluana which enabled me really to put precision on the work I've been doing, high precision. <laughs> um, now, if you want information about the, uh, the megaliths there, just put your head in this hole here and download. <laughs> 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 right? <laughs> this is a very big stone, as you can see, and you've just got the space to put your head in it. There are a couple of stones like that, so if anybody's into that kind of thing. But you can see the size of them. There's another one. Uh, this is a very old stone. It's at the other end of the Care Mario alignments. It's an important one. It's called uh, the Manio. Uh, and it was uh, built maybe 5000 BC. It's sort of halfway between the Neolithic and the Mesolithic area. And it has five snakes uh, engraved at its bottom. There's a little hole here. You can go in and see them. Uh, if you can go underground here. And in front of those five snakes, there were five axe heads planted in the ground, Neolithic axe heads, which came from the Alps. Uh, that's the other end of the alignments, which continue through the field. Then after that, you go a bit further, and you come to the Kerlescon, Le Petit Menec alignments. These go east-west, I'll come to that. You have a square quadrilateral here. And they go off then, they go across this road which separates Karnak from the neighboring town of La Trinité. So they're all fenced off here, but once you get into La Trinité, you can go and see them. <laughs> and they're in the woods. They're no longer in Karnak. So uh, let's have a look at some of those. That's sunrise at winter solstice. This is the plateau. And then the stones go down the hill. Here they are. You can see how many, another series of alignments here. And this is the Petit Menek part, where they're going off through the woods and the swamp and whatever. In Karnak, there's also a very well-known tumulus called the Tumulus Saint-Michel. Uh, it's, it's made with 67,000 tons of stone, plus quite a lot of slime, which was dragged out of the bay. And it, it's about a two-meter thick couche of... Uh, um, layer, thank you, of slime which has been put all around it it's, uh, and which has made it um, waterproof inside. It's an incredible monument, 120 meters long by 50 meters large, and it's got a chapel on it. The first chapel was built in the 16th century, and this one it burnt, and this one was rebuilt about 1920. But it's something you can see from all over. And there must have been a standing stone here. Well, there still is a standing stone on it, which has been made into a sort of cross uh, at the other end. But this, this chapel is a very interesting thing when you're trying to work things out. It's very visible from a long way around, as we'll see. And this is another tumulus, uh, which carries on my rainbow, and which is in, it's called Kerkado. Uh, it's considered to be the most ancient tumulus. It's dated at 5,800 BC although the dating just seems to be going back as new dating is done. The recent dating was done on standing stones at 6,000 BC or BCE, whatever, 8,000 years ago. So we're talking about a long time ago. Uh, so there are many of these massive mounds and, and tumuli in the area. Now let's have a look at some other sites. We've got the Erdogan alignments, the St. Barb alignments, and the St. Saint Saint Pierre Quibon alignments, which are on a sort of north-south axis. 
You have to be aware that the sea has come in. It's gone up by about 7 to 10 metres since the Neolithic era. And the average depth of this bay is 7 metres. Recent research has discovered alignments going from here to here, underwater, uh, using sonar and stuff on the bottom. Now, it's a very interesting uh, research which has to be continued. So the first of the Erdogan alignments, this is a fuzzy picture. <laughs> uh, the road goes straight through them, as you can see. It was built in the 19th century, and unfortunately in the 19th century in this area they didn't give a damn about megaliths. Well, they used them for building houses. They were quarries, basically, these alignments, for around 60 years or so, sort of every day, people coming in and taking the stones away. Uh, in 1892, a French archaeologist called Félix Gaillard um, saw that there were, at this particular site, 1,000 standing stones and 5,000 stones on the ground, which makes a total of 6,000 stones, which is twice as many as the whole of the Karnak alignments. Uh, today, there remain, as you can follow this alignment through the woods for about four kilometers, and there are over a thousand standing stones still around, which people don't know about, even people who live there, you know, apart from the hunters, who they don't want to talk about it in case you, they don't, they're not allowed to hunt there anymore. This, these alignments are east-west orientated, so this is a sunset at Equinox uh, along the alignment. Of course, there's trees now. At the, 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 the climate here, uh, 5000 BC it was the same as Madrid today. There weren't any trees. The nearest trees were about 30 or 40 kilometers away, which means the idea of rolling these stones on wooden rollers is, is pretty complicated. <laughs> That's another photo of there. This is a quite a big stone. It's very often struck by lightning. As you can see, it's about six meters high. This is just, in, just behind the beginning of the Erdogan alignments. These are all free to the, open to the public, no fencing or anything. Apparently the Karnak ones are dangerous, but these are okay, but this could fall off at any time. <laughs> Here's another one. Here's a, a man standing here, so you can see the height of that. It's got a flattened top, which has led some people to think that there may have been a, a sort of lintel or something, because there's a massive standing stone the same size just on the ground beside it. And these are some of the rest of those out of an alignments in the woods, as you can see, uh, totally abandoned. Now, these are the same barb alignments. These are very heavily destroyed, um, unfortunately. These are the headstones. You, uh, on these alignments, I didn't say, you get a perpendicular line. The alignments are going down here like this. And you have a perpendicular line at the head of the alignments. Um, this is a kind of sighting point. We'll be seeing this in a second. Um, these hedges are full of standing stones. All these hedges, these are the remains of the alignments. This is farming ground. And there was a new megalith arrived in that line not long ago when a farmer picked it out of the middle here and put it up here. These are standing stones here. These alignments that went for at least 500 meters in the past. And that line of alignments, in fact, what's he doing? That line of alignments goes towards the tumulus Saint Michel that we saw with the chapel on it. So those lines head towards the tumulus Saint Michel, which you could see in the past, in the 19th century, you could see it. You can't see it now because they've built an abbey, a Benedictine abbey on that line, which is called Saint Michel. <laughs> so it has the same name as the tumulus on the same line. I'll be coming back to that. Those are the headstones. Uh, they're about, uh, this one must weigh, let's say, 150 tons, something like that. They're enormous stones. They're quite visible from the Tumulus Saint Michel, which is five kilometers away. Here you can see the lines going down the hill. That's taken from the top of one of those stones, and you can just see the church spire somewhere here, if you look carefully. Ah, uh, is this going to work? No, it's not. That's a film. Can I get that to work? Apparently that's not going to work. 
That's a film of a sunset between those stones uh, on the 8th of May, which is St. Michael's Day. And in fact, that line, uh, which goes from the tumulus of Saint-Michel through the Abbey Saint-Michel and comes to these stones, is an exact sunrise, uh, sunset on St. Michael's Day, which is a rather a strange coincidence. Oh, what's happening here now? Can't seem to get any further. Quibron uh, alignments, um, which you can see here. I've got photos of this in the 19th century where there are no houses at all. If you go through these back gardens, you've got standing stones in them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and there's a cromlech here. These trees, uh, this is a stone circle with two tennis courts inside. And these alignments go down to the sea here, to this particular stone. That's the stone circle with the tennis court on this side. Uh, those are the alignments. I, the, the only picture I had on me, um, the reason there's this helium balloon in there is because I do quite a lot of filming with helium balloons, <laughs> which enables you to get above things to see stuff. Um, this is in someone's garden. There's the alignments. You see, we're in... Uh, these are holiday homes, so you can go in when people are away. <laughs> <laughs> this, is on the, this is on the beach. These are the rest, the remains of the alignments uh, which are on the beach. There were 20 lines here. Uh, the remains have been found of 20 lines. Uh, in Karnak there are 12. So these were very important alignments. There's another one, pretty big stone. Of course, people can't turn these over to find shellfish underneath. So. Now, coming back to this map, what we're going to look at now, Gavrinis. Uh, Gavrinis is the most important monument in this whole area, I believe. Um, uh, this T-shirt is a reproduction of one of the, the stones. This monument is entirely engraved. There are 25, I think, 29 stones which make up the corridor and the chamber, and they're all engraved. Um, this is very symbolic and everybody who goes there and says, oh, that looks like a banana, or this looks like something or else, that's not the way you have to do this. <laughs> so this is a close-up view of the Gulf du Morbihan. You can see this river. That's an underwater, it's now underwater river. At the time, this river went, was above water, I suppose. Um, and this is the second strongest current in Europe, which means when the tide comes in, you get the tide coming in here, the river coming down here, and you get this kind of meeting between salt water and fresh water just in front, and it makes big sort of um, whirlpools and stuff. And this is happening just in front of the entrance to the Gavrinis chamber, which is here. That's on the island of Gavrinis. And if you come in June, we'll be going there. We've, we'll be having two hours alone in the monument. Um, this is another monument which is on private property belonging to the, the um, boss of Reader's Digest and he doesn't let people on there, he's a man with a shotgun. <laughs> but I've been. <laughs> um, and I have photos of it. It's a very, very, very important monument. It's the sister monument to this one. And then you have Air Lanique here which is a, a cromlech. Uh, which goes down into the water and shows how the water level has come up since then. This is Gavrinis. This is the entrance to Gavrinis. It's a very long corridor, 13 metres. goes to a little chamber. These are some of the engravings on the stones. This is the corridor. There's an engraving, which a uh, close-up, and this is a quartz stone. Uh, it's the only stone which isn't engraved in the corridor, but it's in a special position. And these, this is the Air Lanique Cromlech, which goes, it's a double circle in fact, going downhill. This is the, you can see it here, round like that. 
and then it goes down underwater, very low spring tides, you can virtually get the whole of the first circle above water. There's a second one underneath. Now, last but not least, <laughs> the Grand Menhir, which means the big standing stone, the Grand Menhir brisé, or the big broken standing stone, because it's now on the ground in four pieces. This is an aerial view of that site. This is the Grand Menhir, so there's four bits. Now, this hasn't fallen by chance, because this is a tumulus uh, with a dolmen in it, and this standing stone is exactly the base, this part of the base of the standing stone is exactly aligned along that tumulus. You can look along this line, it's exactly along the line. So if the whole thing fell in some other direction, maybe this way, that was moved round. <laughs> uh, this stone weighs or weighed, if you put all the bits together, 350 tons and was about um, 20 meters long. It's made out of a, a stone called orthognice. Is that right? Uh, which is not local. So this stone comes from at least 15 kilometers away on the other side of the Morbihan Gulf. Uh, so, right. Uh, the, when there were digs, archaeological digs done, they discovered the remains of an alignment here, 16 stones. There were the holes for those alignments to be in, for those stones to be in. This is a, a reconstruction. This monument uh, 15 years ago looked a bit like a pentry fan in Wales. Uh, you had three stones holding up a massive stone, whatever. Now it's been redone. So this is the modern version. Uh, the, in, the inside has not been moved, of course, and there's a fantastically, uh, fantastic engraved stone inside, which we're going to see, uh, and that's the tourist spot. Right, this is the standing stone. In fact, it's totally carved. You can see the lines down here. So was it carved before they got it here or afterwards? Well, anyway. Uh, this is winter solstice sunset. That's the base of the standing stone. This is the entrance to the Dolmen Table des Marchands. And that line, the sun's going to come down here. So it's an exact winter solstice sun line between the standing stone. In other words, the shadow of the standing stone comes and licks the mouth or the entrance to this dolmen at winter solstice sunset. This is the stone, this is a reproduction of the stone which is inside the dolmen. It's called la table des marchands, or the déesse, the, the, the goddess of the table des marchands. It's an incredible stone. We'll be coming back to this. It's made out of uh, limestone. So it's a different stone to all the others. It's white, it's white limestone with very high mica content in it, uh, which means it sparkles when light comes on it. And it's very symmetrical. Oh, sorry. You have a sun here. It's, in fact, this is a reproduction which isn't very well done because this stone is in fact a sort of rounded equilateral triangle. It's got a sort of rounded signs to it, but it's not in fact a circle. It's a triangle uh, and it's got rays and you've got a kind of central column here and things sort of vibrating off it on either side. Now we're going to be looking at this in more detail. I don't know if you can see the bird here. Can you see this bird? That's its tail, these are his wings, that's its head. And it's flying up a line of quartz here. And then there's a kind of moon-shaped thing here. This stone, a lot of these standing stones were uh, engraved like this. And this stone was, but it's all worn off with time. This stone was re-erected, it was a fallen stone, it was re-erected a few years ago. And this engraving was found underneath, so it had been protected against erosion. Uh, and there's a very, very interesting study to be done, I think, looking at what's on the underside of these standing stones. And we'll be seeing another one in a short time, a stone which was erected, re-erected in, in 1989, and which is an incredible clue to what's happening. This is an example of a dolmen. It's called Mane Braz Dolmen. Uh, I just put this here because there are 220 dolmens in this area. So this is one of them. <laughs> 
Uh, it's an incredibly heavily populated area as far as megaliths are concerned, and major monuments. These, you know, these are the major monuments in France, well, anywhere, really. Right, the, the and, size and scale of these monuments begs questions like when, who, how, why. Firstly, when in Brittany from 6000 BC, or minus 6000 is how we say it in France, but 6000 B, BCE, 3000 years before the official pyramid dates. Who built them? Now I've put here the megalithic people, not Druids or Celts. This is just because at 6,000, you know, there are no records of Celts or Druids or whatever from that time. Uh, I'm not saying that information wasn't passed down, but there's no way it can be sort of said that the Celts or the Druids actually built these monuments because there's absolutely no evidence for that. How were they built? There is no serious hypothesis on transport. Um, I'm not saying this. This is the major French archaeologist who put that in a magazine last year. In this magazine there were loads of drawings with people with ropes and, and rollers and stones and stuff all over the place. And then the, high, the title said, there is no serious hypothesis on how these stones were <laughs> So don't look at the pictures. Uh, as far as the organization's concerned, that's what I'm going to be talking about. Why? Well, I'll answer that with another question. Link heaven and earth, question mark. So a few notions of sun and moon observation. Uh, you probably know all this already. Robin talked about some of this yesterday in his talk. Uh, as you know, uh, the sun moves up and down on the horizon from winter solstice to equinox and to, uh, that's winter solstice, equinox, summer solstice if the north's here and these are the sets on the other side. The equinox dates in the middle here approximately. And then you've got intermediate days which I won't go into. Now, this one's in French but it doesn't really matter. What this shows is how that works. It's because the, the Earth is tilted, which means that at winter solstice, the sun just manages to get out a little bit and does this bit, whereas when the Earth's tilted towards it, at equinox, it's doing this. So it's always on the same path. It's just that the, the Earth sort of tilts more into it or tilts out. Uh, so this, at any latitude, will give you four major points, which are the four major points uh, of winter solstice and summer solstice sunrise and if you put a standing stone in the middle of that then you'll have some kind of simple observatory so here's Montserrat quadrilateral in Portugal unfortunately I can't invite you to go and see this because it's now under water but these yeah I know they've moved it yeah but it's under the site is underwater yeah you can't go and see this in its original environment it, they've moved it I know <laughs> yeah but you can't, in fact, you can't move a megalithic site. Sorry. You just can't do it. You can move the stones, but you're not moving the megalithic site. Well, anyway, uh, you see these, these cranes here. They're building a dam, and that dam's now in functioning. There wasn't much news about this. Um, this is in Pluarnel, which Pluarnel is about two kilometers from Karnak, two or three kilometers from Karnak. Uh, it was a very important megalithic spot, but a lot of the stuff here got ruined because it wasn't Karnak. Um, quad, the, this quant, uh, Krukuno quadrilateral uh, Robin showed yesterday, the diagonals uh, go towards the winter solstice and summer solstice. Now, I hope this video is going to work. This is where I put a camera on winter solstice and with a bit of luck, oh God. Let's go back. Yes. Minus seven degrees Celsius. So I'm in the corner angle. So I'm going to look down the diagonal here.
since the megalithic builders built this, the sun has moved at winter solstice by about 0.7 degrees, which is about the size of the sun when you're in the corner. So it's not exactly in the original alignment, but as you can see, it works. It works very well, in fact. <laughs> it's a very interesting place to be. Now, why was Karnak chosen as a place? There's a very particular point to be made here, is that these solstice angles at Karnak are very particular because in minus 5000 BC, which is around when this was starting, this angle is the angle of a three, four, five triangle. That's a very simple triangle. Uh, it's the first right angle triangle. Uh, and this is, is only true at that latitude, uh, which means that I've coined a term called natural geometry uh, because in, in school we learn geometry on pieces of paper, whereas in fact that's got nothing to do with geometry. <laughs> uh, this is geometry in the sky and the land. It's a kind of link. Uh, and we'll see this is very, very important. It means that if you put the Krukuno quadrilateral here, then you get these diagonals, as we were saying, and you have a relationship here of three to four, which gives you the diagonal of five. So we're talking about a sort of natural geometrical sacred site and quite obviously these people you know, who built this sort of knew about this you can, couldn't possibly do that by accident it would lead one to believe that people came here to do this this isn't sort of local tribe who did this uh, it was a chosen spot uh, Professor Tom who surveyed this uh, sorry the, the archaeologists who want to put this down uh, say that it was rebuilt in the 19th century so you can't base anything on it. That's quite false. Aubrey Burl has said how well reconstructed it is according to the plans from Lucas and Dryden in the 19th century. And also Professor Tom points out that the north, south and east, west axis uh, uh, lines here are so perfectly orientated to the north, south and the east, west that they couldn't have done it in the 19th century. <laughs> Which is a very interesting point. Um, the French Royal Observatory, which was, well, it wasn't royal, was it? The French Republican Observatory, which was built in 1860-something, has an 18-minute uh, error as far as true north's concerned. <laughs> Whereas this monument, I've done it with a theodolite, and it's just perfect. Uh, so... There you go. That's it, exactly. Right, exactly. Yes. Okay. But that's quite a good point, in fact, yes. You, you, and you can, if you looked carefully, you would see that the stone that you are looking through, it goes just through between two stones, and the stone is rounded at exactly the height where the sun comes out on the horizon. So there's a kind of hole in the stone. Right, so that even though it's a small monument, it's precision. Yeah, I agree. This is just the, to remind you how we get a 3-4-5 triangle in a very simple way using a rope with 12 uh, knots in it and this gives you a perfect right angle this is how the right angle is still to be found and this is a very interesting question is when was a right angle angle introduced into human society for the first time and what difference did it make uh, I can't talk about that now sorry but it's a very interesting question because right angles sort of stop things whereas circular forms move things right? not quite a bit of time before Pythagoras well a very long time probably because here we're talking about right angle 6000 BC it may have been here but in Gebekli Tepe which is dated at 9600 BC the stones have got very good right angles on them now let's have a look at this dolmen of the Tab de Marchand in Locmariaquer 
This is a, a ground plan. This is the black bit here is this stone, which is not perfectly centered on the axis of the corridor. Uh, this is an engraving which is on the ceiling. Now, winter solstice sunrise, the sun comes in down that diagonal there and hits the left-hand side of this stone. I'll show you this in a second. It hits the left-hand side of this stone. As the sun rises, the sunbeam comes down. And in fact, the angle of the doorway, the doorway is like that with a right angle, which means that the sunbeam has a kind of right angle on it, and that right angle comes down along these marks, which means that we've got a calendar system here. <laughs> um, now, there's a picture of... That's this, this is the uh, stone, the agaival stone we've just seen, and this is the sun rays coming down here and lighting up just this left-hand side. At the time of building, this would have happened, but a bit higher up because the sun gets in here. Now, it's a, bit, it's a bit higher over the horizon. At the time when it came in, it would have been lower down. So you get the same angle, but it's, a bit, it's not the same height. And this is taken down the corridor to show how the shadow is on the diagonal. Look at this. Is this going to work? It started. This was a film of this. Let's try it again. Right. Well, there was a film of this. <laughs> um, could, could we come back to this? Because I, I've got rather a, a heavy schedule here. And seeing as we started 20 minutes late, well, it's what time is it? Five past one. I'll be very willing to answer all questions at the end, but I'd like to get through. Let's have a look at the Gavranis monument, which is on the island of Gavranis. Now, this is the same business. The sun comes down a diagonal. There's a special stone here, which is kind of jutting out a bit. And the sun's first rays, in fact, hit this. And when they get to the exact angle of a three, four, five triangle, they then go into the chamber. So this stone here has enabled the system to be uh, kept up to date even though the sun's moving. don't know if you get that. This stone blocks, this stone here blocks the sun rays until they're on the angle of the 345 triangle as the sun moves, which means that the sun only comes into this chamber when it's exactly on the angle of a 345 triangle. Whatever period of, the, of, of history you watch it, We'll see some pictures of that. This is the stone in question. It's got engravings on it. This is a bit after sunrise, as you can see the beam coming right into the chamber that's coming down the corridor here. So this is the stone that lights up first. And once the stone's got to the exact angle of a 345 triangle, which is how it would have been when it was built, then the ray goes right into the end of the chamber. I've got a film of this which isn't going to work. Pity. Let's try it again. Now, for some reason, films aren't working. One of them did. <laughs> so what about the right-hand side of the monuments? We've seen how the sun lights up the left-hand side, goes down the diagonal and lights up the left-hand side. What about the right-hand side? Does it, like us, remain in the dark? <laughs> so let's have a look at this. We're going to look at the moon here. You know that Professor Tom uh, worked on the moon a lot on the famous 18.6 year cycle. You have the sun, when the moon is full, it rises opposite the sun, but not exactly because the moon isn't on the same plane, uh, which means you can have a kind of uh, difference on the moon's position, which runs over an 18.6 year cycle, which means the moon can go higher towards the north, further towards the north than the sun ever does. And it also goes on the inside. I mean, most of you may be aware of that idea. Okay, so that gives us something interesting because at the Karnak latitude, the, sun, the moon at its maximum uh, position is at 45 degrees, 
which is the exact diagonal of a square. Now, this is a very interesting coincidence. What I like to point out here is that I'm talking about the sun when it's sitting on the, uh, the moon, when it's sitting on the horizon. The sun, we're counting its first rays as the, as the rays come out of the horizon, because you can see them. <laughs> Whereas the moon's first rays, first of all, you can't see them, and sometimes the moon isn't full. So if you've only got, say, the, top, the bottom part of the moon coming up, you won't be able to see it until it's on the horizon. You got me? So, so we're talking about the moon's angle when it's sitting on the horizon, whereas the sun, we're talking about its first beam. And this gives an exact 45 degree angle at that time, which is a coincidence. <laughs> Uh, and if you look at the minor sunrise, we're very close to the angle of the double square, which is all the half square, which uh, it's either a square cut in half or two squares put one in one behind of each other. Now, if we look in the Quiberon Bay, which is this area, about what the moon's doing, we'll see that from the Grand Menhir, this is Professor Tom who pointed this out, certain sites. This is Le Petit Mont Tumulus. There's another one here. Uh, here's the Petit Mont. This is the Grand Mont. This is the Petit Mont. And here there are other tumulus. So this comes from the Goulva Menia, a six meter high standing stone on the tip of this Quiberon Peninsula. Uh, we'll talk about where this one goes in a minute. And this is the Saint Pierre Quiberon alignments, which could quite mean that these stones were placed as we worked up See, the, place, the alignments were placed as we worked up towards this, this uh, particular moment. So these angles, the Quiberon Bay is a fantastic place for this kind of observatory because this is all flat. You've got a sort of higher bit here, so right on the horizon. It's, it's like having a piece of land on the sea horizon, being able to put stones on it as markers. So it's the perfect spot for obs observation. And also here you have east, west, and you, you can see from the tip of this peninsula you see the sun coming up over the sea all year round and setting over the sea all year round, which is perfect for observation. Now I've worked out here that there's a grid system of all these monuments uh, in Karnak. I won't go into the measurements because that would need at least two talks. <laughs> Uh, uh, and it's quite controversial in this country, I think, the measurements. <laughs> so I won't go into that. Uh, but what we see clearly here is that uh, this is the Mani Mur site. There's a kind of north-south axis here with sites on it which are at distances, given distances. And we've got a grid system of squares of the same size, 3,360 metres square. There's four here, three here, which gives you the three, four, five triangle and then the moon positions are fitted on the double square and the square. So there's a very simple and effective geometrical pattern which enables these things to be put out. Here it is. You see, if you've got an observation point here, then by using sort of 16 squares, you've got the extreme moon positions plus the sun at that latitude with the square, the double square, and the 345. Uh, this is very useful for drawing the corridors of the dolmens that we saw earlier because, of course, if the sun comes in along the diagonal and the moon comes in down the axis, here's how you do it. <laughs> A three, four, five triangle and the squares, and you can, at this latitude, you can do a perfect uh, observational monument with very simple geometry. So. Let's go back to this and look at this. So that's what happens at sunrise on winter solstice. So what happens at moon maximum southerly rise? The moon comes down that angle and it lights up the right-hand side of this stone. So what we're seeing, in fact, is that the moon comes down the angle and as it rises, it lights up the right-hand side of the stone. So we're seeing quite clearly that we've got a left-hand solar or masculine side, a right-hand lunar or feminine side to this stone, and both of them are contained in one single form, which is quite clearly an initial yin-yang or Tao symbol. There's the moon. 
Uh, I just point out that the moon comes up over uh, four major megalithic sites along a line. Here it is. Uh, in 2006, I was able to go inside this monument at 3 o'clock in the morning. It's not a full moon because this didn't, the, the maximum rise didn't happen in a full moon. But there's the moon uh, coming down that corridor. And if you look carefully, and there's a bit too much light here, but that's the shade, that's the moonlight. You can see it on the floor here, and it's on the stone. If we're in pitch black, there, if you put the lights down, you can actually see that. That's a three minute exposure. But you've got the moonlight on the stone on the right hand side. It, had it been a full moon, of course, it would have been a bit stronger. <laughs> So I put a little sentence here, which dates from 5, 000, uh, 500 BC, Lao Tzu, about evasing th evasive things being things anyway. Now, if we look at Gavrinis and the moon, same thing happening. We've got the diagonal of that corridor uh, showing the sun at winter solstice and the major axis showing the maximum moon rise. And in fact, I talked earlier about that quartz stone, which is the only quartz stone in the monument. It's here, Pierre de Quartz, which is quartz stone. And you see that the junction of these two beams is exactly opposite that. Now, these two beams never actually meet, because it can't happen. <laughs> but the hypothetical position of the junction of the sun and the moon is marked here by this quartz stone in the middle of the corridor. Here it is in Gavrinis monument. Uh, this was quite a picture to take. There were bats flying in and around there. I was in pitch black. <laughs> uh, that was quite something. That's the moon down the corridor. So I only got, managed to get one sort of bit flurry photo. Uh, this is a Chinese banner from the Han dynasty. It's the oldest Chinese silk banner known. Uh, it's like a ground plan of the Gavrinis monument because in the Gavrinis corridor you have three sort of stones sticking out a bit which are like sort of step stones as you go up the corridor and in the chamber here you've got the sun on the left and the moon on the right here, look at that. This is take, these stones have disappeared uh, because it, they come from the Petit Mont Tumulus which the... Um, the German army built a, a, a concrete, whatever it's called, bunker on during the Second World War. And a lot of these stones were taken back to Germany, in fact. And the Germans were very interested in these megalithic sites. A lot of surveys were done. But, uh, sorry, but we have uh, these drawings which were made before that by an archaeologist. These are the two stones, these are the engravings which were on the two stones at the end of the chamber. This was the left stone. You'll see there's a circle here with 12 rays, which is quite interesting uh, because this is the sun side, okay? And we've already got a symbolism of 12 linked to the sun here. And on the other side, you've got a square. And you've got a square here with a, a, a line going down it, which looks a bit like a mirror. The Egyptians always portrayed the moon as a mirror. Uh, so. This looks a bit like a sort of square mirror. Anyway, it's a square. And the, as I've shown, there's this relationship between the moon and the square at this latitude. I'm going to look into that. Uh, before I do that, I'd just like to show you some stuff on one or two pictures about Long Cathedral, which isn't megalithic, apparently. Although, on this hilltop, there is stuff going back a very, very long time. The Celts were here. It's well known, there are springs, there are a lot of different things, maybe Robert Temple could tell us about that. <laughs> but this is the entrance to Long Cathedral, and if we look here, right in the middle of this entrance, I'll zoom in on that, look what we see. We've got Mary on the left here, Jesus on the right, the sun above Mary on the left, and the moon above Jesus on the right. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> and if we go inside this cathedral, and if we look on the floor here, we'll find this stone which sticks out around all the others. It's, a, it's 
put in a uh, sort of lozon um, that way in the paving which makes it stick out and it, I looked I went in there and I looked at this stone I suddenly realized that it was split up the joint here was not halfway up the stone which is always a sign of something you see the joint slightly offset that made me look a bit closer and I discovered that so I've got a double square or half square at this bit and if we look at this particular stone here one two three four one two three it's the exact proportion of a three four five rectangle which is really quite interesting I think stuck in the middle of Long Cathedral so we have the three four five the square and the double square marked out in the center of the aisle of Long Cathedral now let's go to the Pyramid of Cheops rather briefly you know this place perhaps this is the King's Chamber um, this was built with massive stone it hasn't moved you know you've got a kind of geometrical shape which has been enclosed in the massive the most massive monument ever built so this hasn't moved and if we look at the oh dear that's a bit wonky it doesn't look like that normally <laughs> This is a kind of cubic, I don't know what's happened there. Must be computer graphics or something, doesn't matter. If we look at this, this, the floor of the king's chamber is well known to be a double square in its diameter, so it's twice as long as it is wide. And it's twice as high, it's twice as, the diagonal is twice the height. So it's half as high as the diagonal of the chamber. Right, so that gives us one, two. And thanks to Pythagoras' theory we get root 5 for the diagonal which gives us root 5 over 2 uh, for the height now what I'm going to show you here is that the 345 triangle is hidden in this chamber because if we draw a bit of it's gone for some reason but if we draw this triangle do you see where it goes from it goes from the lower corner to the opposite corner in the top it goes down one end and along the side. Now if we calculate the length of this, root 5 over 2 with 1, I've done it but you don't have to go into that really. In fact it gives you the answer of 3 over 2. If we look at this side, 2, well that's 4 over 2 and in fact the diagonal, oh sorry, oh dear, I went a bit fast there. Oh well that's good because we're going to get it all now. So 3 over 2, 4 over 2, the diagonal is 5 over 2, which makes that, rec that triangle a 3, 4, 5 triangle. So we've got the double square and the 3, 4, 5 triangle in the king's chamber of the Great Pyramid. Uh, that work is thanks to a Frenchman called Georges Jouven, who is now dead, but who has written an incredible book about geometry. Here's Solomon's Temple. They've, they all look a bit wonky, but... Uh, this, these dimensions are given in the Old Testament you, know, um, you say build a temple which has got such and such dimensions so from that you can work stuff out uh, the, the Holy of Holies here is 20 by 20 it's a square, well it's a cube, 20 by 20 high then you've got the temple which is 40 by 20 which is a double square so the whole thing is 60 by 20 which is a triple square 20 by 60 gives a triple square and the height of it is 30 cubits so in fact the temple, the side of it, is a 345 rectangle. Now that isn't actually said in the Old Testament, right? but it is in fact a 345 triangle. The side of the Temple of Solomon is given with that dimension. So quite clearly these architectural principles are existing right through history and across the planet. So let's have a look at some of these shapes rather fast. Let's say that the circle equals the heavens because in the heavens everything is circular and round, the sun, the moon and the planets and everything turns in circles whereas on the earth we have the four cardinal directions, I won't go into that but let's just look at these shapes, the square has a 45 degree angle, uh, this is the cromlech at the head of the Kerleskont alignments which is a square and which is north-south orientated. The double square in Karnak, you can put inside this, it has an angle of 26.6 degrees. The tumulus Saint Michel that we saw with the chapel on top goes in that.
because it's 50, th these measurements were made in 1862 by René Gall, uh, 58 meters wide by 115 meters long. Um, right, this is 6,000 years BC, this tomb is 5,500 BC, so it's well, well preserved. Now let's look at the triple square. The triple square is very interesting uh, because the diagonal gives off this angle of 18.435 degrees. Ever heard of that? No? Right, well, maybe. But let's look at the Menic alignments here. The Menic alignments are exactly orientated along that line, the line of a triple square. Professor Tom worked out with the theodolite the angles of this, and the average angle that he gets for the first seven lines is exactly 18.435. He didn't actually connect that to the triple square, but I mean, he did a lot of other things. Um, the first seven lines here are exactly on that angle. You have to realize, of course, that the, the lines which are nearer the road have been more disturbed because with the building, they took the ones nearest the road first. Right? So the further north you go, the more you're in undisturbed territory. Uh, and that's also Solomon's Temple, as we saw. Now, what's very interesting is that if you double that angle, 18.435, you get the angle of a 3-4-5 triangle. If you take a triple horizontal triple square and you put a vertical triple square on the end, that gives you 4 by 3 and in fact doubles the angle, which is very interesting. It doubles exactly that angle. And if we look at the 3-4-5 triangle, well, you can put the Kerr-Mario alignments, which are the next ones along that Karnak alignment. So the first lot are going on the triple square, and then the next lot, you're doubling that angle and going up on the 3-4-5 triangle, as you can see here. This is very precise. Uh, I haven't got time to go into the whole thing, but uh, it is a very precise thing. And in fact, the lines come in at the beginning here on the same angle as Lamenic alignments, and then they kind of turn and come along this angle, which is at the end, they're perfectly along the 345 angle, seen from the center of the chamber of this dolmen here, and it goes right through that big old stone called Lemanio, which has the, the five serpents on it, at the end here. That is perfectly precise over approximately one kilometer, which means perfect north-south uh, calculation as well. So that's the Kermario alignments. I just thought I'd put what Plutarchus said about the 345 triangle, what the Egyptians thought about it. And I've also, I didn't manage to, to get to the first conference, unfortunately, because I wanted to see it, but uh, I know it was about music, but this is the perfect chord, do, mi, so, and the relation 345 is the vibrational relationship between those notes. Uh, so musically, the 345 triangle is what's called the perfect chord. There's a second Pythagorean triangle, which Robin has talked a lot about, and which he's linked between Stonehenge and the Priscelli Mountains, the Bluestone site, the 5-12-13 triangle. Um, I've put it this way up because it's on the Air Gra, the major standing stone site. This old alignment, which had disappeared, is it exactly at 22.6 degrees with respect to the north? <laughs> so you've got the 5, 12, 13 in here. And I've done the whole geometry of this, which is rather complex, but extremely interesting in the same units. But again, I can't go into that today. Uh, just to show you that the tumulus itself, if you take the base, this is flu... You can't... Google Earth doesn't do high-definition images in, on these French sites, unfortunately. But it's clear enough to see, this is done with Google Earth, this is the angle given by Google Earth, which is exactly 18.44 degrees. So this long tumulus, which is 160 meters long, is exactly on the same angle with respect to the north as Lemenic alignments, 18.44 degrees. And when we're talking about hundredths of degrees here, right? This isn't sort of approximate. <laughs> this is perfectly exact. Now let's look at Gavranis and the moon. I talked about that earlier. We saw that the moonbeam comes right down this Gavranis chamber. First of all, the table des marchands. I hope you 
catching up with all these names. This is the monument that was rebuilt in the, uh, about 20 years ago, but the outside was rebuilt. The chamber and the alley are still perfectly as they were before. Uh, the moon comes straight down that angle, and as it does so, I pointed out, it comes over a tumulus called Manihe Hoek, uh, the site of Kerpen here, on the edge here, uh, Gavranis itself. I was looking for something which would be lined up along the, the axis of the Gavranis chamber, and I came to this stone. Where is it? Oh, dear. I have to go through all that again. Just a second. I came to this stone, which is called the Menir, the Kermayer, the Kermayer Standing Stone. Now, this is another one of these stones that was re-erected in 1989. Unfortunately, Professor Tom never got to see it. Um, it was re-erected. It had been fallen since about 3000 BC. So, because they found underneath it stuff, you know. Uh, which means that it's been fallen on the ground for a very long time. And when it was erected, there was an engraving underneath it. Uh, now look at this. This is the standing stone. Look here. Now, uh, this bit's a bit round the corner. We're going to have a close look at this engraving, which was on the bottom of this stone. It's a square with a moon on it. <laughs> right? <laughs> and this is in the projection of the Gavrinis corridor, right? It's about four, four and a half kilometers away. It was visible from the Gavrinis chamber. The tip of this standing stone, well, the top half of this standing stone was clearly visible. And as you can see, we've got it right on the corner here. You've got the, the point of the moon, this crescent moon. There's a clear geometry to it as well because the length of the moon is exactly the diagonal of the square. <laughs> now that proportion again is very interesting uh, and the height of it is half the size but some very interesting geometry there. So this clearly is a key to what was going on. In fact I found this backwards, you know, I'd already found the, the stuff <laughs> But when I discovered that, when I said, well, there must be a standing stone, and I saw what was on it, you, know, you can imagine a sort of tingle went down my spine. So this means that, in fact, these two major monuments, which are the Table des Marchands and Gavernis, and these two, this is the Petit Mont Cairn, which dates from 5700 BC, and which is an enormous cairn with two dolmens in it. This is the one that the Germans built a bunker on. Now, when you look at that, You've got an organization here with a square, a double square, the diagonal. So if you go from the Kermaya Menir to the Grand Menir, the big standing stone, you get the diagonal of the double square, which gives you the minor moonrise. So there's a perfect astro-geometrical -geome installation, uh, organization going on here, uh, which is very moving. Uh, this is just uh, a thing from Babylon showing how in the third millennia we were already sort of doing squares inside squares and using root two and all that stuff. Now accurate landscape geometry requires accurate cardinal directions. We talked about this, Robin talked about this. Um, this is the Tumulus Saint Michel again with the... Uh, this is another standing stone. Now, if this video works, oh no, it's not going to work. That's a pity. Well, can't do anything about it. What this was going to show you is how along an east-west line we get the sun rolling up that tumulus Saint Michel at Equinox and sitting on the top of the hill. <laughs> this is taken from the tumulus Saint Michel again. This is on the 8th of May, St. Michael's Day. Uh, now, if we go behind this, so this is a sunset, which is quite a pretty one, isn't it? Behind the Abbey Saint Michel. And if we, go, if we could see the horizon, you can see the horizon here, which means that before the Abbey was there, you could have seen it with those standing stones on it. And that sun is going down between those two massive standing stones at the St. Barb alignments. So there was a perfect 8th of May 
thing going on here. Now what's very interesting is that this corresponds also to the minor moonrise. <laughs> so that's something that needs to be carefully thought about. When you're on the top of the tumor of Saint-Michel, there's an island in the bay called the, the um, Meabon. And on winter solstice, the sun sort of irks out between the two bumps and kindly produces the Egyptian hieroglyphic for the horizon. <laughs> you can account, the two, as I said, the tumor of Saint-Michel is 120 meters long. So if you can account for the time difference by walking along the tumulus. All right, so the tumulus kind of includes the movement of the, of the Earth's axis over a certain period. And I'd like to finish by talking, um, I'll come back to England, uh, and I'd like to, sorry, I'd like to finish by talking about Maes Howe, which is in Orkney, up here. Now we're in fact 1,270 kilometers due north of Karnak. Right? <laughs> it's on a perfect north-south line. And if we look at Maes Howe, you probably know it. Uh, you probably know it better than me, in fact, because I've never been there. Uh, and I've nicked all these pictures off the internet, so I'd like to thank anyone if, if you're here and you took these photos. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> uh, so this is the, the Maes Howe Monument. And this is the corridor going to the Maes Howe Monument. Here it is, very thin, long one, like Gavrenis. And here's the beam of someone who's taken a picture of this at winter solstice, the beam coming in along that corridor to light up the end chamber. Exactly the same thing as what we're finding in Karnak, of course. Now I've picked, this is Victor Reis, who worked with uh, um, Ewan Mackay on this monument. These are his drawings. Now what's very interesting is that the diagonal of this monument is an exact three, four, five triangle. And it's turned round. So in Karnak we had the four side here, the three side here, and the five side there. But once you get to that latitude, you've got the four side here, the three side here, and the five side up there. Uh, Robin talked yesterday about Bryn Cethlithi in Wales, which we worked on, where they've they've positioned the site so they get the three, four, five because the sun comes up behind a mountain well, you've, and you've got it on the, the, the latitude of 53.2 degrees but here at, in the Orkneys this monument quite clearly shows an exact three, four, five angle uh, now that doesn't correspond to sunrise now uh, the sun comes in along that angle now about 20 days before winter solstice uh, or 10 days something like that and uh, it's coming virtually down the central axis here at winter solstice now that got me thinking because when I looked at the date of the winter, it's sunset sorry I'm saying sunrise, this is orientated towards sunset so when the sun sets here uh, along that 345 triangle, I looked at the date of that, of when that happened, and it happened, in fact, when the Earth was at its maximum axis, when the axis was tilted to 24 and a half degrees approximately, in 8900 BC. Uh, so, in other words, I realized that this diagonal was marking a winter solstice sunrise at its most southerly point over a 41,000 year cycle. Now that got me thinking because I thought, well what does the other diagonal do? Now if we look at this, when you look out of the chamber there's a thing here called Ward Hill, which is an island in fact. There's water between this bit and this bit. This is an island. When you look at this, the left part here is at an angle of 26.59 degrees. This is Ewan Mackay's theodolite work which is very close to the angle of the 345 triangle. I'm talking about this spot here on the hill. So in other words, the diagonal of that corridor points towards the left-hand spot on this hill, and the other diagonal points, points towards the right-hand side of that hill. Now isn't that interesting? Especially when I worked out 
that in fact, in the year 11,000 and something, when we get to the Earth's minimum angle decrease, the winter solstice sunrise will take place here. So that if we look at this, <laughs> this means that these two diagonals are in fact pointing towards the extreme winter solstice sunset. The monument kind of takes in the, the possible angles of the winter solstice sunrise over that 41,000 year period to a very high precision and it's using a hill to do that. And nobody's going to move that hill, right? <laughs> Which means it's a very, very uh, solid and important foresight. And not only that, it's rounded which means that the, moves, the, the sun's movement, which would be a sort of pendulum movement, which would be slowing down, it would, uh, you know how pendulums work, they sort of accelerate and then slow down, and then they speed up and accelerate. The fact that it's going around a hump like that will mean it'll have a constant movement. It seems to be an incredibly sophisticated way of doing it, things. So just to put that into pictures, this is what you'll be getting 8,900, we get to here, the middle, this is now, because we're in the middle of the cycle, and that's why now it comes down, there's a standing stone here called the Bound Stone, which is exactly in the central axis, axis, sorry, and then further as you go, the sun's going to go there, and if we're still around in 11,800, we could see it rising there. Now that's very, very surprising. Uh, because basically you can't build a monument like that and observe this over 41,000 years. <laughs> it's not possible. Right. Exactly. You can't, it's not an observational, that can't be a thing for observing. That's the thing for... Maybe it's a statement. Well, exactly, that's it. That's what I'm saying. It must be a statement because it can't be anything else, which means that this knowledge was there, apparently, they knew about the 41,000 year cycle and it's written in using the 3-4-5 triangle. So you see the Orkneys is the co-latitude of Karnak, which is probably why there's such a large concentration of very important monuments. Right, I'll stop now. Alignments, the St. Barb alignments in Plouarnel, the St. Pierre Quibron alignments, the Gavrenis um, chambered temple instead of tomb, and the Grand Menia Brise, which maybe some of you have heard about, which is the largest standing stone ever erected, which was over 20 meters high. First of all, then we're going to look at Karnak uh, and the different alignments. So first of all, I'll present the monuments, and then we'll try and understand, maybe, what they're about. First of all, in Karnak, there are supposedly three series of alignments, uh, which are end-to-end -end and go over four kilometers long. The first one's called Le Menek, which you can see on an aerial view here. It starts here. There's a cromlech, or stone circle. Well, it's not a circle, it's a, a stone egg which goes round the village here, and then these alignments go off in a certain direction, and then they change direction about halfway up. So if you look at these stones, there are quite a lot of them. In the Karnak alignments, there are 3,000 standing stones uh, today. Another interesting feature is that this is bedrock, 
um, and these standing stones are uh, put up on virtually no soil. All right, so some of them, you can actually see them balanced on the bedrock. Uh, I won't be able to talk about the geological side of things in this talk because I've had to choose what I'm going to talk about. But if you do come to Pruhanel in the month of June, I'll be explaining as well the geological uh, part of this monument, which is very interesting as well. Uh, this is the part of the Cromlech which goes around the village. It's the Cromlech, the, the Menek egg. The stones are touching each other, you know, and it goes all the way around this village. In fact, goes through a house on the, on the left here. Some of the stones are recumbent and were... There's another one. Uh, this is a very old stone. It's at the other end of the Care Mario alignments. It's an important one. It's called uh, the Manio. Uh, and it was uh, built maybe 5000 BC. It's sort of halfway between the Neolithic and the Mesolithic area. And it has five snakes uh, engraved at its bottom. There's a little hole here. You can go in and see them. Uh, if you can go underground here. And in front of those five snakes, there were five axe heads planted in the ground, Neolithic axe heads, which came from the Alps. Uh, that's the other end of the alignments, which continue through the field. Then after that, you go a bit further, and you come to the Kerleskon, Le Petit Menek alignments. These go east-west, I'll come to that. You have a square quadrilateral here. And they go off then, they go across this road which separates Karnak from the neighboring town of La Trinité. So they're all fenced off here, but once you get into La Trinité, you can go and see them. <laughs> and they're in the woods. They're no longer in Karnak. So uh, let's have a look at some of those. That's sunrise at winter solstice. This is the plateau. And then the stones go down the hill. Here they are. You can see how many, another series of alignments here. And this is the Petit Menek part, where they're going off through the woods and the swamp and whatever. In Karnak, there's also a very well-known tumulus called the Tumulus Saint-Michel. Uh, it's, it's made with 67,000 tons of stone, plus quite a lot of slime, which was dragged out of the bay. And it, it's about a two-meter thick couche of... Uh, um, layer, thank you, of slime which has been put all around it it's, uh, and which has made it um, waterproof inside. It's an incredible monument, 120 meters long by 50 meters large, and it's got a chapel on it. The first chapel was built in the 16th century, and this one it burnt, and this one was rebuilt about 1920. But it's something you can see from all over. I mean, there must have been a standing stone here. Well, there still is a standing stone on it, which has been made into a sort of cross uh, at the other end. But this, this chapel is a very interesting thing when you're trying to work things out. It's very visible from a long way around, as we'll see. And this is another tumulus, uh, which carries on my rainbow, and which is in... It's called Kerkado. Uh, it's considered to be the most ancient tumulus. It's dated at 5,800 B.C., although the dating just seems to be going back as new dating is done. A recent dating was done on standing stones at 6,000 BC or BCE, whatever, 8,000 years ago. So we're talking about a long time ago. Uh, so there are many of these massive mounds and, and tumuli in the area. Now let's have a look at some other sites. We've got the Erdogan alignments, the St. Barb alignments, and the St. Saint Pierre Quibon alignments, which are on a sort of north-south axis. You have to be aware that the sea has come in. It's gone up by about 7 to 10 meters since the Neolithic era, and the average depth of this bay is 7 meters. Recent research has discovered alignments going from here to here underwater uh, using sonar and stuff on the bottom. That's a very interesting uh, research which has to be continued. So the first, the Erdogan alignments, this is a fuzzy picture. <laughs> uh, the road goes straight through them, as you can see. It was built in the 19th century, and unfortunately in the 19th century in this area they didn't give a damn about megaliths. 
well, they used them for building houses. They were quarries, basically, these alignments, for around 60 years or so, sort of every day, people coming in and taking the stones away. Uh, in 1892, a French archaeologist called Félix Gaillard, but most probably like that from the word go, uh, some very big stones. This stone is particularly, where is it? This stone is particularly important, these recumbent stones, because they position things. They're sort of central points. And there are the alignments. The alignments are very often on a plateau, and then they go downhill. So that's uh, another thing we find. They go through water and ice, <laughs> up and downhill. Now here's the Care Mario. So these are a bit further along. Uh, when you get to the end of the Lemenic alignments we've just seen, you do about 460 meters. <laughs> and then you come to the beginning of these alignments. You have a dolmen here. These, this, this is the head of the alignments. And these alignments go up through this lake there are standing stones at the bottom of the lake and they end around here. Well, the fencing, I mean, you may know that Karnak alignments were fenced off about 20 years ago uh, and the fencing ends here, but the alignments, in fact, continue in the woods. <laughs> right. So these are the Care Mario alignments, as you can see. Uh, I don't know how many of you have already visited this site, but it's really quite impressive. This is the uh, Care Mario Dolmen. I was doing a survey. You saw the first picture at the beginning where I was with the theodolite on the recumbent stone. Uh, I'd like to thank Robin Heath who got me back into theodolite work two years ago when he came to Pluana, and which enabled me really to put precision on the work I've been doing. High precision. <laughs> um, now, if you want information about the, uh, the megaliths there, just put your head in this hole here and download. <laughs> <laughs> right? This is a very big stone, as you can see, and you've just got the space to put your head in it. There are a couple of stones like that, so if anybody's into that kind of thing. But you can see the size of them. ...factors that make this talk very, very essential for anybody interested in megaliths. The first is that Howard has done more work than anybody else in the area of Brittany. And he's done it thoroughly, and he's done it with good scientific background principles. The second thing is that he takes wonderful photographs, and he can explain what he's done. And he does that in English. So, if you are inspired, as I'm sure you will be by this talk, you might like to consider either this year or in future years, attending the wonderful Solstice Festival that's held near Karnak uh, in June every year, and go and see what is an absolutely amazing collection of megaliths scattered around the landscape, many of which you will never even have heard of, in English or in French. So I'd like to get, uh, ask you to give a warm welcome to uh, Howard Crowhurst. Thank you, Howard. Hello. <laughs> uh, I'm very pleased to be able to talk to you about these Karnak megaliths. It's the first time I've ever done so in English. I'm very used to talking about them in French, but I hope my English is going to be up to... There's all the vocabulary. Well, anyway, if, if you don't understand anything, just butt in. So, uh, these are the Karnak uh, megaliths. We talk about Karnak, but in fact it's a whole area of France, of southern Brittany, now, is this going to move? Yes, it is. Uh, just to situate what we're talking about on the map, which I'll be doing all the time, uh, the area we're going to be looking at is here. It's the southern, it's called Le Morbihan, which means the little sea. Uh, it's in southern Brittany. Here's a bigger picture of it. <coughs> And the Karnak alignments are these, but we'll be looking also at the Erdogan 